Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another Appside Insight webinar. Uh, my name is Tracy, and I'm a nurse educator here at Insight. Um, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are presenting today. So for us here, that is the Yagara and Torabuk people in Brisbane. I would like to also pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal um, or Torres Strait Islander peoples who might be joining us here today. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce and welcome Professor Nick Lintazeris and Sandra Soonjik from the Drug and Alcohol Service in New South Wales. We are very lucky to have two very accomplished uh, researchers and addiction specialists to discuss their project, which aim to improve the identification and treatment of people with co-occurring mental health and substance use issues. Um, as well as increasing collaboration between clinical teams to ensure better coordination of care for this population. Um, I've been looking forward to this one, and I'm sure you'll all be very interested in this findings. Uh, unfortunately, Sandra's a little unwell today and doesn't have a lot of voice, but she's still here with us and she's going to help with any questions that might arise. Uh, so just a quick little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If anyone has any issues viewing the webinar, let us know by using the chat function and we will attempt to assist. Uh, likewise, if you have any questions for um, our presenters, pop them in the chat and we'll get them answered at the end of the presentation. So over to you, Nick. Yeah, thank you, Tracy, and thanks for the invitation to come and um, present uh, to the um, in the Insight Forum. Um, and um, I also just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm in. I'm actually in the Gadigal I'm on Gadigal land as part of the Aora Nation, which is somewhere around in there somewhere, if you'd expand the map. Um, so thank you. We were um, invited to present on, let's try to get the next slide up. There we go. About um, some of the work that we've been doing, uh, looking at how we can work more effectively between mental health services and drug and alcohol services. Um, I just want to acknowledge that the funding for this project came from a Mind Gardens um, grant. And Mind Gardens is a collaboration between University of New South Wales, Southeast Sydney, Black Dog Institute, and Neura. And it, it um, aims to provide um, uh, linkages uh, between clinical services and uh, research groups in the mental health, addictions, and neurosciences um, sphere. So that's where the funding for a lot of the, the background project work happened. Also just want to acknowledge um, Sandra Sunjik, who's um, been the project coordinator for this project, um, and we wouldn't be here without her. Um, this work is actually though, um, has involved lots of people. So, um, in, and it's included clinicians, consumers, and academics. Just particularly want to highlight the people involved there. So Sandra Sanjik, who provided the overarching uh, project management, but the two researchers themselves who've actually done much of this work have been Dr. Kath Foley, um, who is um, uh, um, based at MDARC at UNSW and Emma Black, who is um, based at uh, University of Sydney and works with us in um, at South East Sydney Drug and Alcohol Services. And you can see there's a cast of, um, of quite a lot of people there that have been involved in various um, sort of leadership roles in the project. And this includes, uh, as I said, clinicians, consumers and academics um, from largely from NDARC um, and South East Sydney Mental Health and Drug and Alcohol Services. So just some background, um, we were, um, I think many of us working in AOD services have, um, have struggled or at least, um, you know, tr try to address the challenge of working effectively between mental health services and AOD services to address comorbidity. Much of the research that's been done historically in this space has actually looked at efficacy and effectiveness of specific interventions for particular 
um, patient groups with specific conditions or disorders. So an example might be, you know, someone will do a study, a randomized controlled trial, looking at whether or not a particular counseling intervention or a particular medication or the combination of both improves outcomes for people with a specific condition, for example, concomitant depression and alcohol use disorder. Um, and so there's been a lot of these kinds of randomized controlled trials and there's been systematic reviews of those kinds of interventions. But I think many of us would appreciate that the challenges for consumers and clinicians working in this space is um, really sort of the, the difficulties, I guess, of especially in Australia, of working in a quite a fragmented Australian healthcare system. And the fragmentation is not only between the traditional you know, differences between primary and specialist services um, um, that we see all around the world. But in Australia, you know, you're familiar that we have the, the community Medicare model and a hospital funded um, uh, specialist system. And then we have a lot of community specialist services that uh, are funded through state hospital systems, yet often operate in, in the community. So we have this very unusual um, sort of split in Australia uh, between state and federal funding. Then on top of that, we also have the added sort of fragmentation of a lot of private sector services and also varying roles for NGOs um, working in this space in different sort of both mental health and drug and alcohol NGOs um, in different and sort of the, the, the level that they engage varies across Australia. We have to appreciate that for they often have very different funding models and also different um, staffing profiles. So the kinds of um, staffing that you might see in a specialist hospital based system is not what you necessarily see in, in primary care or in NGOs. And then often the private sector is often, as we all know, uh, much of it is um, the service you get is often linked to the type of private health cover you have. So this fragmentation makes it really difficult to do health services research in Australia. It also makes it very, very difficult to, um, to learn lessons from other parts of the world. So the US healthcare system, the British healthcare system, uh, many parts of Europe, they have very different sort of uh, funding models and the way that they organize their healthcare services. And so the kinds of fragmentation we see here in Australia is often not as evident in other parts of the world. It makes it really difficult to, to learn lessons from, um, from work done overseas. The other challenge I think um, many of us will appreciate is this issue of working in silos. Now this varies across Australia, how mental health and drug and alcohol services are organised varies from state to state and indeed from you know, service to service. So in some organisations, mental health and drug and alcohol may be um, come under one governance structure, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they work effectively together. So um, this, this silo um, approach has been something that um, I think most of us would appreciate has uh, made it more difficult to work together. And it also really highlights that collaboration doesn't just happen because people want it to happen. You do need it, you know, you need obviously willingness and will is important, but it also takes time and resources. And often we don't have the, the um, sort of um, time and resources allocated to collaborating between services. So this makes it really, really difficult. It's a big challenge in our sector uh, in terms of uh, how we address comorbidity. The context of the project that we embarked on really came out of um, a, a group of us identifying the opportunity to work more effectively through our shared electronic medical record systems. So in New South Wales, back in 2013, 2014, all um, state run New South Wales health services. So this is in the districts. So we call them local health districts. I know other parts of Australia call them local health networks. But all mental health and AOD services transitioned over to the same electronic medical record system. We call that CHOC EMR. 
So the fact that we were all in the same medical record system meant that we could actually see, for the very first time, we could actually see each other's clinical notes. And so we started thinking, okay, once we can see each other's clinical notes, that will automatically mean we'll get better communication, better collaboration between the services and between sectors. Now, you know, five, six years went by and whilst there were obviously some benefits of being able to see each other's clinical notes, what was apparent that simply having shared medical records didn't actually result in us having, um, you know, achieving better communication or necessarily working more effectively with our, with our clients and consumers. So that led us to um, seeking some funding from Mind Gardens to look at the, the possibility about how we could use the shared electronic medical record system as a platform to improve um, integrated care between the two service systems. So when we first started the project, it very much was with a lens of how can we make our EMR work more effectively? Now, the objectives then uh, was that we, when we started the project, it was to look at then how we would design a comorbidity package that was built into our medical record systems. And so the idea is that we would have, you know, electronic, you know, that there will be indicators and dashboards and processes and um, alerts and things that go bing and all that kind of stuff in our medical record systems. Um, and the idea is that we would then streamline access to the information, reduce duplication of records, increase coordination across services, and also that hopefully this would improve our ability to identify clients who had both, um, uh, both, um, you know, that are that were located in both service systems. So very much at the outset, it was how do we come together to improve the way we use our EMR now. Uh, we decided to do that using principles of co-design and really, really importantly, the whole idea was that in order to make this work, it was really about how do we build these systems from the bottom up. So rather than just going to management teams or to IT teams and saying, um, you know, can you build this into the system, we thought it was really, really important to actually go and talk to consumers and clinicians get their sense about um, how we could work more effectively. And initially we started going to them with, um, with focus on our medical record system. Um, and over the course of the project, we kind of identified that actually that was too narrow a focus and we actually had to think far more broadly. And we'll look at sort of, sort of where we landed and where we ended up and how we progressed. But I just really want to highlight some of the um, sort of the activities and methodology that we embarked upon. Now, there's a lot of work has been done in recent years about co-design and co-design is also used. Um, there's sort of, um, sound, they're starting to sort of be, people are drilling down in sort of um, identifying there are different types of co-design as well, that you know, co-design is, is a broad umbrella within which there's lots of ways of doing co-design activities. The process that we embarked on, first and foremost, was to do a data mapping. So that was actually go and look at our EMR systems in mental health and drug and alcohol, and go and extract where in the mental health record, was there anything about drug and alcohol? What kinds, you know, where, where would a clinician document these things? Um, um, you know, were there outcome measures that were being incorporated into mental health, like things like MOAT and so forth, um, that captured drug and alcohol issues? And likewise, we went to the drug and alcohol EMR to do data mapping to see where in the medical record could we find anything to do with mental health. So that was a data mapping exercise to begin with. We also then, uh, we engaged a whole bunch of people, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and we identified that there, um, so, and so sort of started breaking groups into small manageable working groups that started to address different um, parts of, of the project. We developed case studies. Now, the case studies were ways of, of coming up with some common types of clinical presentations that we knew were confronting our services, and then taking those case studies to the different teams. So taking it to separate mental health teams and to separate drug and alcohol teams, 
and just getting the, the clinicians from those services to describe how they would work with a client with that client. And then we were able to look at, well, how did the mental health teams say that they would work with that client? How did the drug and alcohol team say that they would work with the same kind of clinical presentation? See was, you know, whether or not there were sort of different uh, approaches, different orientations, were they uh, familiar with each other's um, resources and services and so forth. So that was a really useful exercise to sort of get a sense of, um, of how the different clinical teams uh, approach working with clients with the same kind of presentation. We also did journey mapping, and that was that idea of, well, how does a client travel through each of the different systems? So if a client presented to mental health or to drug and alcohol or presented to say primary care or to ED, how would that client sort of work their way through the system? Um, you know, what are the intake, the assessment, at what point in time would there be, would there be collaboration with the other service system? What is being communicated with primary care, the GPs and so forth? We also did a lot of focus groups of bringing clinicians and um, consumers and different teams together to start to sort of um, get, um, be able to explore um, some of the things that were coming up through the journey mapping and the case studies and to get um, able to expand on some of the, the, the work um, that they were doing. And then ultimately we took all of this to some design thinking labs. And the design thinking labs are the, those sort of in the, you know, also known as you know, co-design laboratories where you get um, facilitators um, to come in and then work with large groups of clinicians, consumers from both teams. We also had, well, you can see there on the right, um, the kinds of people that were engaged in this process. And it was really, really important that we engaged people from both mental health and drug and alcohol. And you can see we had people there from, with lived experience, we're fortunate that both mental health and drug and alcohol services in Southeast Sydney employ um, peer or consumer workers. Uh, whilst that's fairly common in mental health services, it's not common necessarily in drug and alcohol services, but this is something that in Southeast Sydney, we've uh, actually had employed consumer workers now almost for a decade. Um, and we see them as a, an essential um, um, component of our, of our workforce. Um, we also had lots of clinicians from both teams, uh, from both services. And when I say from both services, within mental health, we identified there were um, two or three or three clinical mental health teams, one from sort of acute sort of inpatient services, one from a community mental health team, and, and one also from uh, sort of a, a um, the so the, the, the rehabilitation team. So that was a, a sort of a, a longer um, stay unit. Within drug and alcohol, we also worked with opiate treatment programs and also ambulatory care teams um, that do a lot of um, outpatient counseling and outpatient withdrawal um, and relapse prevention. So those are the two key teams. We also engaged a lot of our um, consultation liaison workforce, both mental health and drug and alcohol. It was important to have our health information managers and data specialists and researchers from both services managers, so both middle management and senior management. So you can see that this was a really inclusive, uh, an, an attempt um, to make sure that all the people that had sort of skin in the game were actually part of the process. And that I think was one of the really important things in the whole project. But when we started um, sort of looking at the questions about how can we improve care for people that have both concurrent um, mental health and substance use issues. Um, a number of things just kept coming up and it was clear that a focus on electronic information systems was important, but by no means was that gonna be adequate to address these broader issues. And a lot of this really comes out of, you know, 20, 30, 40 years of siloed um, workforces and siloed health systems. So consistent with some of the comorbidity guidelines that we have in New South Wales, and this is also mirrored in the national comorbidity guidelines. So, you know, there's nothing ever, I mean, the, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in, in New South Wales, do we need to rewrite the comorbidity guidelines? And 
there's nothing wrong with the guidelines that were written to in back in 2009. It's not that the guidelines were wrong. It's just that they were never implemented. And there, you know, we see this a lot, don't we, in um, health systems. Someone bangs out some guidelines, a box gets ticked. Yep, we've got the guidelines, but then very little follow through in actually implementing systems that actually allow services to follow the guidelines. Anyway, um, so it was possible to sort of identify there were six broad themes that kept coming up and a lot of the work we were able to sort of identify that many of the issues and many of the potential solutions could be clustered across these six themes. One was workforce and governance, clinical pathways, um, how we provide clinical care, our information systems, issues around lived, um, lived experience and expertise, and a really important thing about team connections. How do we um, try to address some of the siloing of our workforces? Um, so throughout all that process of talking to clinicians, talking to consumers, focus groups, data mapping, journey mapping, and the design lab, what came out of that was lots of ideas, like too many ideas in many respects. I mean, this is really, really encouraging. It's not as though our workforce and our consumers didn't know what to do. There was plenty of ideas of what you know could be done to improve the system, which was really, really encouraging, but also a little bit daunting about, well, how, what were we gonna do with those 120 ideas? But we were able to actually so sort of turn those into sort of about 50 ideas um, that thematically a lot of, there's a lot of sort of duplication or subtle variations on those. So those 120 were then sort of distilled down to 50, which we then did a little bit more work. And this is a lot of the great work done by Emma Black and Kat Foley. They were then able to distill it down to sort of 35 key ideas that we were able to then um, align those with the, each of the six domains. I'll show you those domains in a moment, the kinds of ideas that were being generated. From which the, um, we then went through um, a ranking process, a process whereby we went um, then to um, um, our senior sort of drug and alcohol and senior mental health management teams, and also to our uh, lived experience um, um, group, so our consumer workers, peer workers, and uh, people with lived experience. And we got each of those three groups, um, mental health, drug and alcohol, and people with lived experience, to then go and rank those 35 ideas to identify what were, you know, so each, each, each group got to rank what would be the key things that they want, would want to see move forward. And then we were able to bring the rankings of those uh, from those three different groups together to come up with a, what we currently have is a top 10 sort of uh, um, top 10 ideas or solutions that we propose to look at how we move forward with, from which we will develop a work plan and we'll look at that in a moment. So what were the 35 ideas? So on a page, you can see here, um, across those sort of domains, a, a range of kinds of ideas and um, these slides will go out. So don't, don't fret or worry about you haven't got time to read them all. Um, we actually, in order to do the ranking systems, we also had to provide a little bit more information about what each of these ideas were so that people could understand what we meant. Um, so there's a little bit sort of more information there. And so these are the kinds of issues that came up in the governance and workforce. Um, there's a whole range of issues there. One of the key things there was, uh, and we were hearing this a lot from clinicians, about we actually need much better clarity from senior management about what is it that we are expected to do um, and what's realistic. So that kept coming up about, Leadership needs to come to the party here and actually uh, provide a little bit more information, uh, so a little bit more guidance about what the expectations are. Because you look at those clinical guidelines that get written by, you know, senior government, and they're all encompassing. You know, 
there's kind of like, you know, you should, we should be doing everything, but the reality is we can't do everything all the time. So that idea of it's really important for senior leadership to sort of uh, set the, 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 provide clarity about what it is we're supposed to be doing. So that's one of the key issues. Um, clinical care, a whole range of ways of working more effectively together, things like, um, you know, joint case review meetings, co-located clinics, a whole range of things there, staff exchanges, interactive care plans, using our EMR systems better and so forth. Clinical pathways, how do clients move around the system? You know, how do we do our, you know, how do we refer between, resort, uh, between services? What are the resources that different services have? How do we make that, these kinds of um, pathways more meaningful for consumers and clinicians? So again, you know, can we provide a lot of information direct to the consumer, um, not sort of have it always, uh, you know, having clinicians as the gateway of information and so forth. So lots of ideas were coming up there. A whole bunch of stuff about how we could make our EMR work better. Um, and a lot, of their, a, a lot of focus there also about the importance of training. Um, and the training is not just orientation, but ongoing training as well. And I'm sure anyone who's had to work with EMR systems will appreciate, you know, just we often have brilliant systems but most of our staff don't know how to use the systems to their optimal level. I use the analogy of, you know, the old VCR machines, you know, they could do lots of different things. You could actually program, you know, <laughs> record a TV show six months in advance, but most of us never, you know, got beyond um, sticking the videotape in and hitting play record. I'm probably showing my age now when I'm talking about VCR machines. So I apologize to anyone under the age of 40. Um, and then a lot of work about team connections. And this was also really encouraging that staff and consumers were saying, hey, look, can we actually just like get to know each other better and spend some time together? Um, and that I think also was really emphasized because this project started and got funded before COVID and then COVID hit. And then, you know, we weren't even seeing people working in our same teams. You know, there was a lot of work from home or you know, people weren't going out, everything shut down. We tried to do a lot of, you know, Zoom meetings and MST meetings, but I think you know, everyone's familiar that, um, you know, a lot of that kind of that, that, um, getting together just didn't happen during COVID. So there was a lot of emphasis, I think, about, you know, can we actually start connecting again as clinical teams? And I don't think that was just a COVID thing, but I think COVID probably um, amplified that. We also um, wanted to have a focus up around the issue of lived experience and um, that idea of, and one of the strong issues that coming through was the consumer workers in mental health and drug and alcohol also felt that they were siloed and that they didn't have an opportunity to, to meet and get to know each other and share experiences. Um, and they were the ones who were probably most vocal on the issue that, you know, the silos, the silos are, are, are actually probably one of the biggest problems in accessing care, um, you know, that, if you're a, uh, a consumer and you have both mental health and drug and alcohol issues, you know, the, the experience of having to negotiate two separate systems really came through loud and clear, especially with a whole range of issues around trauma, you know, having to tell your story multiple times. Um, and also one of the real challenges that I think was also acknowledged that for many people with concurrent mental health and substance use um, uh, conditions, that we often see um, quite a lot of uh, cognitive impairment as well in, uh, in people with uh, both conditions. I mean, in the AOD sector, in the work that we've done, uh, in clients in our sort of specialist AOD services, we've estimated around 40% of our clients, 40% of our clients actually have a, a functioning with a, um, with, a, with a dementia-like level of cognitive impairment. That's not necessarily long-term or permanent, but that's their level of function. 
Now that might be because they're still using benzos, alcohol, range of things. But either way, if, we're, if we know that over a third of our clients have got significant cognitive impairment, that a lot of our, the ways that we, you know, the things we expect our clients to do just doesn't make much sense. You know, go to this, you've got to be at that appointment at 9 a.m. and then you've got to be somewhere else at 11. You know, it's, it just starts getting really complicated. So a lot of it was the, the, the engaging people with lived experience was, was really important, uh, I think, to understand just some of the challenges um, for, for people that are accessing our services. So we took it to the different groups um, and um, um, to the different sort of management groups. So DAG is the drug and alcohol governance group, uh, mental health service development and implementation committee, a lived experience forum, and um, also the um, an information, the, the um, informatics people also had an opportunity. So putting all that together, we then were able to come up with a ranking of what we identified as the top 10 projects or the top 10 things we should um, prioritize in terms of the, the potential solutions. So let's have a look at those, each of those. So one of them was the ability to start establishing um, joint case review meetings. I also probably should have emphasized that our focus also, you know, comorbidity between mental health and substance use is huge, isn't it? I mean, you know, think about it. We know something around 60% of people accessing mental health services also um, use substances um, well, or actually would meet our criteria for a substance use disorder. Not necessarily dependents, but have got some forms of harmful substance use. And we've got a similar kind of proportion in drug and alcohol services. Depends, you know, how you define it. But somewhere between 40 to 60% of our clients would also have a mental health condition. So when you've got two thirds of clients in each service system ticking a box of comorbidity, it was clear that we actually had to just focus a little bit about, well, what are we, what are we gonna, what are we gonna focus on? And very much the uh, very early on, we identified that the area of greatest need, the greatest risk and the greatest impairment for consumers were those individuals who, if you think of a quadrant about mental health and drug and alcohol, where you can sort of say there are sort of mild and severe mental health conditions and mild and severe drug and alcohol conditions. And if you put those on a, on a graph and you had that quadrant, I think you guys should all be familiar with this quadrant analogy, that there are some people that are gonna fall into that severe mental health and severe substance use. And they're the ones that very much we identified, we're gonna focus on those because that's where there's the greatest need. And they're also the ones that actually impact our service systems the most. They're also the clients who are most likely to be engaged in government sector services, um, you know, with specialist mental health and specialist drug and alcohol teams. So that was very much the focus. I should have highlighted that earlier. Um, so the kinds of strategies and solutions that, you know, coming from the ground up that have also been endorsed by senior management has that been that idea of joint case review meetings, um, shared training, that was seen as really, really important. Um, there was a recognition that there's a lot of our mental health workforce did not feel skilled in, um, in addressing substance use, um, either in assessment or management or referral pathways. And similarly in drug and alcohol, there was a big sort of um, element of the drug and alcohol workforce that similarly did not feel confident in their mental health skills. We also identified the need for co-located clinics. So uh, for, for um, you know, specific clients that were being um, worked by both uh, mental health and drug and alcohol services, the idea that for some clients actually having a co-located service where both mental health and drug and alcohol clinicians work together for clients would be worth exploring. The importance of attending to governance, of having ongoing um, structured governance uh, systems that, that provided that leadership and direction 
and where somewhere where we could also land, uh, bring things back to when things when um, if things weren't working effectively for different individuals. Um, and a focus on EMR training, orientation and training. And a lot of this was also not, you know, orienting drug and alcohol clinicians to how the mental health um, EMR works and how and orienting mental health clinicians to how the drug and alcohol EMR works because it's not intuitive. You know, if you don't know how mental health, you know, if you don't understand what MOAT is and a whole range of other sort of processes, their workflows, you don't even know where to go looking in their EMR and vice versa. So those were identified as the top five. And the next five, so, you know, we end up with 10. So regular peer worker get togethers, um, streamline uh, referral processes and pathways. I can talk about that. You know, our referral pathways were not streamlined. Um, that's something we can, you know, easily address. Um, Models of care, um, look at, uh, again, that sort of senior governance, um, uh, sort of uh, whether or not it's a memorandum of understanding, a procedure, business rule, something along those lines. Um, uh, Co-design a framework for clinical decision-making. Um, there's a lot to unpack in there as to what that means. And the idea also of service exchange between teams, the idea that um, you know, mental health clinicians could come and spend time in drug and alcohol and vice versa. So they were the sort of top 10 sort of strategies coming out of the project um, that have been identified uh, in terms of moving forward. What are the next steps for this project? So ongoing consultation with management across mental health and drug and alcohol services, the prioritization of solutions. So each of those 10 items um, or potential solutions will then, will then work those up into more detail about what does what might this look like, what kinds of resources are required for it, and what kinds of timelines and how would we evaluate each of those. So when you look at some of these, some of these are really easy. They're simple wins, not hard to do. Like, can we get peer workers meeting regularly? Yeah, that's not hard to do. And isn't going to take up a lot of resources. Some of the stuff though, actually there's a lot of thinking, a lot of organization. So for example, to, to set up a co-located clinic, sounds simple, but you know, a lot of issues to work through, booking system, oh, yeah, I won't go into it. Um, so some of this stuff is low hanging fruit, easy to do. Some of it actually requires a lot of planning and in some cases, resourcing. So each of these 10 will, will be um, worked up and then, we will look at um, coming up with a plan for implementation. Some of that is, well, what can we do? What have we got the resourcing for? And what's a timely sort of rollout? Some of these things make sense to do in a particular sequence of events from which we'll come up with a work plan and then uh, also make sure that evaluation is built into any of the potential solutions we're gonna be looking to implement. So look, what I've described is a very specific project done in, in one part of Sydney. But what might be some of the lessons, I guess, for other AOD services, sort of trying to address the same issues of working more collaboratively with our mental health teams. So one of the things that really um, struck out was just what a strong desire there was from clinicians and consumers across both services to collaborate and to do things better. Like that was one of the really encouraging and um, really positive things that came out of it. And linked to that was the bottom up approach that, you know, if you were, you know, if you're an observer and you, you looked at the siloing between mental health and drug and alcohol that has sort of existed over a long period of time, if, you know, if you'd landed from overseas and you sort of turned up and thought, guys, you're not like, do you guys hate each other or something? Like, what's wrong? Why are our service systems so not connected, um, at least in New South Wales? I'm not sure 
look, maybe in Queensland they're better, but here in New South Wales, our service systems have not been connected for a long time. And you could be sort of, you know, you could, you could assume, well, maybe people don't want to work together, or maybe there isn't a sense that there's a problem here, but no, that wasn't the case at all. Strong signals coming from the clinicians and the consumers. We want to do this better and we want to work better together. So that was really positive. But also what struck us was that these organisational sil silos that have sort of developed this inertia now for many, many decades, that we actually needed a very structured process of a specific research project um, that had timelines and importantly had resources was really, really, really important because it was kind of like the catalyst to allow us to overcome that inertia. Um, the importance of building things from the ground up and the importance of having strong leadership from the top down. And I think that also was really, really important. We, you know, um, hard for senior management to ignore um, what consumers and clinicians um, are saying but also important for consumers and clinicians to know that the things that they're going to be coming up with will, and you know, will have the ear and hopefully the support of senior management. So, you know, I think it was really, really important. This was a combination of bottom up, but also recognizing the importance of engaging people at the top as well. And the other key learning, uh, which I think many of us already knew, but it really got amplified just how important involving consumers and consumer workers in the journey was. And I would go a step further, the importance of actually having paid consumer workers um, on this journey, because that meant that we actually were able to have a group of consumers that started the, the, the project at the beginning and were able to see the whole project through and not just using like a, you know, like a consumer advisory group where you bring people in for one session, ask their thoughts, and then you never see them again. And six months later, you get a different group of consumers. So the importance of actually building that into the project with continuity, I think was also really important. And another thing that, you know, for, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the director of drug and alcohol services at Southeast Sydney. Whilst mental health comorbidity is clearly one of our priorities, um, it's not the only comorbidity. You know, we have to address things like how do we work better? I want to say comorbidity. It's not the only service system we need to work better with. We need to work better with ED. We need to work better with primary care. We need to work better with pain services, with BBV services with aged care services, with youth youth services. AOD issues span the healthcare system. And we're never gonna do this well if we stay you know, in our little silos. We've gotta get better at how do we work more effectively with other parts of um, um, health, health systems. And for me, one of the, you know, the idea that the temp, that the, the, the method that we applied here and a lot of the learnings or the lessons coming out of this, for me, was really, really instructive about, you know, is this sort of a template on how we may start to work more effectively with other parts of the service systems? Because many of the issues that come up, those sort of six domains, you could actually apply those for any area of, you know, where you want to get different parts of, um, of healthcare services working together, uh, when you look at those kinds of six, six issues. So there's some of the, I guess, some of the key lessons uh, for, for, for us moving forward. Our project hasn't finished. So, you know, we're giving you a sort of a, a snapshot of where we've come from, how we approached and some of the lessons learned. It is by no means the only project going on trying to address mental health and, and substance use comorbidity. There's a lot of work in different parts of Australia. Look, there's a lot of work, different parts of New South Wales looking at different models of doing this kind of work.
But as far as I know, this is probably the sort of the project which is sort of focused much more on this co-design approach of sort of bottom up and getting consumers um, and, and service providers from both teams to sort of design the models um, from the beginning. And I think that's it. Yep, that's the that's the um, end of the slideshow. And hopefully we've got, oh yeah, we've got about 15 minutes or so. Excellent. Yeah, you did very well. Um, thank you very much, Nick, for a, such an interesting presentation. And I think we can all appreciate the challenges of effectively managing treatment for those with those concurrent mental health and drug and alcohol issues, and also implementing those guidelines that we already have in place. It's such an important area, and this cohort is needing so much support. Um, and obviously, your work has identified so many of those challenges for the clinicians and the consumers. Do have a couple of questions for you. Um, we have been asked, is there risks of unnecessary mental health and, um, involvement for people who may only have a primary um, substance use issue and how will that be addressed? I sort of got the impression from you that you're identifying the co-occurrence of these issues before the teams are involved. Um, would that be correct? So, yeah, look, there is so much comorbidity, yeah, isn't there? You know, and that idea of, you know, the drinker who comes to AOD services who is alcohol dependent and they've got some depression and some anxiety. Um, but they, you know, they've never had a major effective, uh, you know, um, disorder diagnosis. It's not, as, you know, these are not, not necessarily someone who, you know, has had, you know, major depression or bipolar, those kinds of severe, severe conditions, but they present to services and they're clearly um, you know, uh, have features of depression and or anxiety. You know, and this yeah, is a very yeah. common presentation. So this is what we meant by we really want to focus on, on those quadrants. If I sort of like, you know, mm. if you have mental health on one end, drug and alcohol, so that patient, I would say, is severe substance use, but mild mental health. So they would exist in that bottom sort of, yeah. you know, quadrant. There will be other people in, say, mental health services, say, you know, the schizophrenic patient who also uses some cannabis. They're not, it's not severe substance use, but it's a severe mental health condition. So part of what we wanted to do in this project is provide the resources and the linkages for mental health clinicians to know where to go for the mild substance use condition, in some cases, what they may be able to do themselves. And now increasingly, there's a lot of really great, fantastic online services um, where you don't necessarily have to refer someone to a drug and alcohol service to get some harm reduction advice on safer cannabis use. Yeah, for example. Yep. Or how to plug into a controlled drinking program for someone who is drinking at hazardous alcohol use, but not necessarily dependent patterns of use. So, you know, there's lots of things you can do there. So not everything has to go to the drug and alcohol service. Yeah. And not every patient with a little bit of depression is going to be referred to specialist mental health. Yes. That's my point. They won't accept yeah. it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So very much a lot of our focus about the kinds of things that we were going to be focusing on is that severe quadrant group, that severe yeah. mental health and severe substance use. But providing uh, resources and orientations to, to both substance use or AOD and mental health um, clinicians about where or how they can access resources for their clients who might have a mild mental health condition or a mild drug and alcohol condition. We are, look, in, in drug and alcohol, we also take, you know, we employ psychologists. We have psych psychiatrists, we have psych registrars, we have a large element of our workforce who actually are skilled and equipped to deal with a lot of that mild to moderate mental health. Yeah. One of the issues we identified that that isn't the same in mental health. Mental health actually has yeah. very few yeah. staff who are trained and credentialed or skilled in drug and alcohol. And that, I think, reflects the Australian mental health system. Um, our, within mental health, the, sort of the, the 
best comorbid clinicians, if you know what I mean, actually is the workforce that comes from the UK. They're much more skilled in um, in dealing with AOD issues than the Australian men, uh, trained mental health workforce. And I think that reflects that over in the UK. Um, drug and alcohol is very much integrated into mental health. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so somebody else is asking, did you come across um, sort of the attitudinal issues um, identified between the mental health and AOD clinicians? Um, I know in my experience, you know, we do get sometimes a bit of a barrier in the AOD sector about including mental health. And um, we definitely do see that with the mental health, including AOD. Was that sort of shown in your research too? Um, no, quite the opposite, actually. Okay. And that was that thing about, about you know, the, the, the willingness to work together. However, let's be clear. Who are we talking to? We are talking to a specialist mental health system and a specialist drug and alcohol system. Yep. Um, service. So these are services that, you know, uh, you know, lots of doctors, lots of nurses, lots of psychologists, lots of social workers who, you know, most of us have been trained to, you know, at least sort of know that comorbidity is there and it is part of our job to do this stuff. Yeah. Those issues around, oh, no, 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 that patient's got mental health, we don't do that. That is something we see much more in um, uh, our NGO service system that probably reflects their workforce, you know, where it's a, you know, they don't necessarily have the same workforce um, and they don't necessarily have the resources to be working with people with severe comorbidity. You know, a lot of NGO rehabs, for example, well, we won't admit a patient who has to be on quetiapin. <laughs> well, no, we can't do that. You know, so those kinds of, those kinds of um, sort of, is that attitudinal? I don't, it's not just attitudinal. I think a lot of it's just historical. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mental health doesn't do drug and alcohol and drug and alcohol doesn't do mental health. We did not experience that. We were worried we might experience some of that sequential thinking that is kind of common. Well, I've experienced it in mental health a lot where you refer a patient to mental health and they'll say, well, we'll treat their depression once they stop drinking. Yeah. So once they stop drinking for six months, yeah, then refer them. You know, that that sort of sequential stuff. Yeah, and that's what we see. Other, when all the evidence is telling us that's yeah. nonsense. Yeah. So we've actually got a lot of people actually have commented saying that that's what they're seeing, that there is this issue of working together rather than um, instead of that sequentially. Yeah. Um, we've probably only got time for one more question. Um, we've got, considering the over-representation of the called and Indigenous clients and consumers in the service, um, this lady was curious about what cultural representation was included in the initial group so this project was done in southeast sydney the whitest part of sydney uh, i shouldn't say that there's also the shire that's pretty <laughs> that's also in cold denial but no it's fair to say that um in southeast sydney where this was done and this was done in the northern part of southeast sydney so this is around i don't know if people know sydney Randwick, Maroubra, Botany areas, um, inner city, um, you know, Kings Cross, Darlinghurst, um, and then the, the, the rich suburbs of, you know, Wallara, Rose Bay, those kinds of places. So there are pockets of social disadvantage, but there's not a lot of, and, and also quite a, a large um, Aboriginal community, so La Perouse, which was, you know, ground zero, um, and where there is a strong uh, Aboriginal community there, that was in with this catchment. We also uh, did try as much as possible to have our Aboriginal workers engaged in drug and alcohol at the time, there was some workforce issues, I think in mental health, we did though, have our Aboriginal um, health workers involved in the project. It's fair to say though that I think cold, representation was 
not a prominent feature. And I agree that's a problem. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, so I, we're pretty much at the end of our time there. So I want to say thank you very much again to both of you. Um, that was really, really interesting. And I think people are going to take a lot away from that. It's certainly uh, sparking a fair bit of chat here in the in the little chat boxes there. Um, but um, we do have to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Um, so thank you again.